Today I'm joined by Tyler Hamilton. I had to think about the introduction for a long time, but anyway. Tyler is a double Olympian, Olympic champion 2000. Tyler competed in eight Tour de France, won a stage at the Tour de France and came fourth overall at the Tour de France in 2003. Welcome, Tyler. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me on your uh, podcast, Christian. Really nice cool. Nice to meet you. Tyler, I heard you mentioned your interest in sports and becoming an Olympic champion was sparked at the 1980 Winter Olympics. Oh, yeah, the 1980 Olympics, uh, the Winter Olympics in uh, Lake Placid, New York. Um, what I think I was uh, eight, eight or nine years old, and um, it was the first time I ever knew what the Olympics were or heard about the Olympics. And I remember watching pretty much the, you know, I think it was two and a half or three weeks of you know, amazing sports on television. And uh, yeah, I was just really in awe of all these different athletes, um, you know, and especially the Americans, you know, we, we had the, the, uh, the American hockey team, you know, we beat the Soviets in the, in the, uh, in the, I think the semifinal and then went on to win gold. And then I remember watching Eric Hyden, the speed skater win five Olympic gold medals. And, uh, yeah, I just thought it was the neatest thing. And, and then, you know, the ultimate would be to stand on top of the that Olympic podium and to hear your national anthem. And, you know, that was really neat for me. And I've just, ever since that moment of watching the 1980 Olympics, I, uh, I, I, I told myself the ultimate would be to win, would be to win a gold medal for my country. You know, so that was always my dream. I loved sports growing up, but, you know, I just wanted to be a, an athlete growing up. I didn't want to have to, you know, grow up and get a real job, you know. <laughs> and I saw, I heard you mention on the podcast that if you would not have studied in a particular city, you would not have become a cyclist, isn't it? Because you had to cycle so much or something. I think it's fair to say, you know, I, I um, originally I was a, a downhill ski racer. That was my real passion up through uh, college, through college. Um, You know, I went into high school. I went to a, a way to a boarding school where I could ski every day in the winter to train. Uh, and in college, I went to University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and after I, I injured my back training with the ski team, and uh, that's what kind of led me into my cycling career. And had I had I not been in Boulder, Colorado, you know, I don't know if I would have made it. Uh, yeah. Boulder is such a huge cycling town, a huge really endurance sports town. And so, you know, right at my doorstep were all these uh, amazing athletes to train with, and coaches, and uh, it was fantastic. I felt very lucky. Had I been in a different town, yeah, you know, uh, there, you know, it takes a lot of luck. And, you know, I was lucky to be in Boulder for sure. Yeah. So I, I definitely uh, think that was part of the reason why I, I excelled so quickly. Yeah. The reason why I asked this question is because the story of Eric Hayden is very similar. I think he grew up in one of the two cities that had an ice ring. That's so right. If That's he right. would not have grown, grown up there, the world have, would have missed one of the greatest speed skaters. Right. Absolutely. I believe he grew up somewhere in Wisconsin, Wisconsin I believe, where, yeah. there, where there was a, a speed skating track. Yeah. yeah. You so know, a lot. I mean, let's be honest. There's a lot of things that whether we have success or failure, a lot of it comes down to, to, to luck, you know, at times, yeah. you know, some, 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 you know, is calculated beforehand, others not, not so much. Yeah. Mm. But for me, you know, going to school in Boulder, Colorado was not for, a, for a cycling career. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm. But it, I was very fortunate to, to spend a lot of time there and yeah. Yeah. Go check it out sometime. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think also the Olympic Training Center is somewhere in Colorado. Yeah, Colorado Springs, a couple hours to the south of Boulder. Yep, yep. Yeah, okay. But it's, uh, you know, it's high altitude. We're at what, I think Boulder's 5,300 feet, close to a big airport, you know, big mountains right out the back door. And so it's a good spot if you're a, if you're a cyclist, triathlete, runner. Yeah, a lot of runners go there in the summertime. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. Tyler. Some of the guests I have, it's a bit difficult to find information about. So for you, that's different. There's a lot of information about you out there. Oh, What yeah. What's your darkest moment? Oh, oh man. That's, uh, yeah, having the positive test back in 2004. 
yeah, probably that was probably the darkest where it was just like a, yeah, if I had to pick one, you know, another, I mean, that, it's hard to say exact, that was one of the darkest moments, you know, another would be fast forward, maybe what, eight years, no, six years, having to tell my parents, you know, the truth. Yeah, that was, I mean, I guess that if I had to really break it down, that would be it, you know, telling, having to tell my, my family. That I've been, you know, not only lying, you know, I've been lying to them for a long time, lying to really the whole world. Yeah. And that was pretty hard, you know. I mean, it's, I still feel emotion when just talking about it right now. But yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Something I never planned on doing, planned on doing. I never felt like I, I would have put myself in that position to have to tell, you know, such a, the truth to such a big lie. But, yeah. but that's what it came down to. You know, there was a lot at stake and, you know, I lied at the time for what I thought were the right reasons. I don't know, but you know, it's, um, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, when you're, as you grow older, you can look back and things become so clear, you know, but back then it was, everything was not clear for sure. My, my head was spinning a bit and, um, but yeah, I feel lucky to have kind of gone through that, learned some really massive lessons and um, that I share today and, and God, really, you know, and, and yeah, because, you know, not everybody did, and a lot of people have struggled through, you know, I struggle a lot myself, but I, you know, there's been um, a lot bigger struggle, so yeah. I feel fortunate, and there's been a lot of forgiveness, which I really appreciate, and I didn't expect, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, in a way, it's been a, you know, it's been a be this beautiful story, you know, the rise, the fall, and, you know, you know, kind of the climb back to nor normalcy, really. But yeah, I, you know, I, I also feel really lucky to have a lot of great friends, family and friends, you know, that help kind of help me through the, the hard times. And so, yeah. Yeah. There's one thing I listened to. You talked about the Omerta, which is the code of silence. Oh, yeah. What yeah. is it and how do you, did you get introduced to it? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the Omerta, yeah, the, the Omerta is the, really the, yeah, the code of silence. Um, it was really at, at the, at the deepest level in the sport of professional cycling that I used to be in. And, uh, the Omerta, yeah, we, we had a code of silence and we were a bit kind of like a fraternity or a sorority where like we had, it was, um, if you got invited in, in, to the inside, you know, you kept, uh, the, the secrets from the inside quiet. You know, and, and you don't you don't talk about them, um, and, you, and you don't really you don't rock the boat, so to speak. And um, yeah, for many many years, I was in the like I was in, in that inner circle. And uh, you know, after I had that positive test in two, in September of two thousand four, you know, I I abided by the Omerta. I didn't say a thing. I kept it quiet. I kept the truth quiet. I thought that was you know the right thing to do. I got caught, but, you know, I wasn't going to let any of my brothers get caught. I wasn't going to be the one telling the truth. And, uh, but, yeah, eventually it came to a point where, you know, I got, um, I got subpoenaed to go, you know, testify in front of a grand jury. And, you know, that was the moment I said, okay, you know, I got to step outside this America and do, and do the right thing, you know. That, pissed off a lot of people for sure you know and and hurt some people too and you know and i feel bad for that but it's that's it got to the point where it was time to tell the truth and, and step away from the america and just do what i know is right what i know is right you know from the heart and, you know i always knew i always knew the difference between right and wrong you know even though yeah there was a the doping went pretty deep within the peloton you know it still didn't mean what i was doing was right yeah so so yeah, the Omerta, you know, it still kind of exists today a little bit, but yeah, I don't know. How it's nice to be, in? it's nice to be, I guess, out of the Omerta and not feel like you have to. Yeah. How you do know, people get introduced to it? Did someone pulls you aside and says, listen, there's something we need to talk about, or is it something that just is so embedded uh, in the culture you feel it? Yeah, something you feel like. It's not like, you know, they came and gave me a certificate, of, like you're, you're invited into the Omerta, but um I guess the first time I really felt like I was being invited into the America was when that uh, one one of my team doctors came into my room and pulled me aside 
told me that I basically needed to start doping, doping a little bit. He, he offered me a little red testosterone pill. And that's when I felt like I was getting invited into it. Cause I knew most likely guys on my team were doing it. There were some, you know, I wasn't 100%, but I was pretty 95% sure that riders on my team were doping. So then I was like, I got invited in and, um, yeah, that, that was the invitation, I guess. And from that moment on, I, I kind of went down that rabbit hole a little bit and, and, uh, yeah. And then you start, you know, then you start living a double life because, you know, people might ask you about it and you got to lie to them straight to their face, whether it's a, you know, just somebody on the street or a family member, friend, you know, mother, father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's when, you know, really, really from that first moment where I was, you know, I took the red testosterone pill that was in the spring of 1997. Yeah. I started kind of living a double life, you know, and then the, you know, the, the deeper the dope it got, you know, and the more success I had, the more, you know, the more of a um, double life you had to lead. Yeah. Really good. What was your best moment? Um, oh, it's hard to say. That's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, you know, winning big races was nice and all that, but it had, you know, yeah, I mean, it had an asterisk behind it. So, like, You know, even standing on the uh, on the top step of the podium there in the Athens Olympics in 2004, winning a gold medal. Yeah, you know, sure, it felt nice. It was exciting, but like it didn't feel exactly the way it was supposed to feel, you know. Uh, you know, I don't know the, the way I ma imagined how it felt for Eric Heiden back in the 1980 Olympics or the or the U.S. hockey team in the 1980 Olympics. I don't know. I won some pretty cool races before, you know, before doping started, you know, winning a collegiate national championships, you know, back in college in 19, what, 93. That was super cool. Like I was so green, like brand, like brand new to the sport or really new to the sport. That was neat. You know, I, over there in, in Holland, I won uh, a stage race, stage race. I believe it was 1996 before doping. It was called the Teleflex Tour. I think they renamed it. It's a different name now, but it was like a five-day stage race. So, you know, you know, winning clean, that was pretty exciting, you know. But then, you know, once the doping started, like, yeah, I just don't, I don't look at those results the same. So, yeah, it was, it was the climb up to that point, which, I, which for me was probably the most fun. Yeah. 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 If you could travel back in time, what advice would you give a younger Tyler? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, listen to your heart listen to your heart yeah be honest with yourself and you know don't rush into any big decision any big decision you know take some time to think take a few steps back look at the big picture think about it and uh oh and you know if you're conflicted certainly talk to friends and family members i wish i'd done that you know? so yeah listen to your heart i heard you talked on a podcast and you said you wish You wished you had heard a story like yours when you got into cycling. What yeah. advice would you give any young athlete in any sport? Yeah, um, you know, back to listen to your heart, right? You know, uh, get good people around you, you know, a good circle of, uh, uh, you know, teammates that, you're, that you are on the same sort of level at, same same. Uh, Get people around you that you feel like you want to be associated with that are going to make you a better person, a better person, better athlete, for sure. Um, so find a good coach that you like, that you trust, you know, find the athletes that you like to train with that are, you know, think a lot like you. Um, yeah. Work hard, never give up and, you know, do it the right way. You know, I mean, listen to my story or listen to, you know, many other stories out there. You know, it's not. It's not fun to go through something like this, and it's it's um, you know you really pay a heavy price for it, and uh, you know it's something I wish I'd taken two or maybe even three steps back and look at the big picture, and, you know, instead of kind of rushing into that decision, you know, to to fit in, you know. I felt like when that doctor came into my room and offered me that little red testosterone pill, for me there was one decision. It was I had to take it, and 
it was, you know, it was deeper than just him offering me that pill. It was like me believing in the system, me believing in the whole team, you know, me um, willing to sacrifice. And, you know, we were a couple of months away from our first tour to France and me like, you know, wanting to be there, if, you know, so. So yeah, taking a few steps back, looking at the big picture and, uh, and making the decisions based on, on your, on your heart, on the way you feel. Yeah. And when you just mentioned that, um, how big is the influence of peer pressure in, in such a team? Is it just you or is it just like, you know, I mean, you're a team, you are supposed to support the champion in yeah. your case. Yeah. Yeah. How big is the peer pressure? Uh, yeah, I'd say, I'd say it's pretty big, you know, you didn't want to let anybody down, you know, the directors the managers, you know, your, your, um, protected leader, you know, you need to be there, but, you know, yeah, there was, there was pressure, there was pressure, but, you know, I, I mean, I could have walked away. I could have walked away. Yeah. But. What are the habits that make you a successful athlete and person? Oh yeah, yeah. Work your tail off. You know, work, 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 work hard. Um, and also, but also be smart about it. Like having a good coach or, or a mentor, or, you know, both. Ideally, both. Um, you know, never giving up. Never giving up. That was, for me, that was uh, maybe my like biggest asset. Like I just had this never give up attitude, and I felt like there were plenty of guys that were stronger than me, but I, you know. I think a lot of them uh, gave up before before me. Um, also, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You also mentioned pain is your superpower. So uh, yeah. Yeah. What is that about? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I just I have a high pain t tolerance, I think, I guess. Um, so yeah, in a sport like, you know, cycling is all about suffering, really. A lot of suffering in the, in the sport and so. Yeah, just able to kind of uh, dig dig a little bit deeper than anybody else. And I felt like that was, you know, the never give up attitude that, you know, having a high pain tolerance, those were my, I think, big things in, in, in the sport of cycling. And uh, I thought it was a big advantage, for And sure. You won a stage at the Tour de France with a broken collarbone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What hurts more, the legs or the collarbone at that moment? Uh, that by that time at stage 16, probably the, yeah, the legs, the legs, you know, I, I, uh, but yeah, it was, a, I had been in a lot of pain really up to that point. I mean, at that point I was so used to the pain in my collarbone and I didn't, it was just kind of a part of me. So it happened on stage one. So I'd been, you know, yeah, but, uh, but the third week there it was, uh, I was just, I was pretty used to it. Yeah. 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 You have rubbed shoulders with some famous and controversial people. In the last years, we've heard, read a lot about Lance Armstrong. Most yeah. of the stuff we heard wasn't that was negative. What do you think, if we go a little bit away from the, from the things we heard, what do you think made him special? Oh, yeah. Um, he, yeah, he had a huge um, desire to win. Huge, huge. Um, probably one like I've never seen before. You know, I like to win, but he needed to win. Yeah. You, know? um, you know, for me, second or third or fourth or fifth place was still really good. And for him, he hated it. For Lance, he hated it. it was, um, you know, he had that. So he had that desire to, to succeed. Um, he trained incredibly hard, incredibly focused. Um, but it also had its, you know, its downside, obviously. But um, yeah, super motivated to win. Super motivated to win, and uh, it, you know, at the good and during the good times, yeah, he'd really motivate the team. He was, uh, for the most part, I'd say he was a good leader. You know, uh, it was tough when you're on. You know, if you didn't uh, achieve all your objectives, you know, if, meaning uh, if you had, if you didn't help him in the in the to your best of your ability or something, you know, you could get on his bad side. And, That wasn't good, but you know, for the most part, when you were doing your job right, he would uh, he'd be he was a good leader and uh, he was supportive of you. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 
how much do you think, again, I'm just asking a very open question, how much oh, do yeah. you think has he changed over all these years? Because he seemed to be somewhat humble in the beginning, but yeah. then towards the end, I remember, you know, he stands on that podium when he won his last tour, said, you know, everyone who oh, yeah. doesn't believe in dreams, you know, you guys get lost. I mean, quote, unquote, I'm buttering it. Yeah. But yeah. basically, you know, having all that knowledge, but coming out and saying these things, how much do you think has he changed in these years and why? Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't know exa how, exactly how much he's changed, really. Um, I mean, we don't, we don't spend much, we, really, we don't spend any time together, mm. you know, but um, I would assume he's been humbled. His feet are closer to the ground than they were before, you know. Um, he's kind of been brought down back to earth a little bit and, and he's had to deal with some of the, some of the reality and the truth that, you know, that not only himself, but a lot of us cheated, you know, during all those years. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, um, I feel like, yeah, he's had to kind of wake up a little bit and, 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 uh, and come, yeah, come back down to earth really. Uh, But yeah, I mean, I, you know, sounds like he's a lot more empath empathetic of a person now. And, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, you know, and I'm happy that he's, uh, you know, doing some good things in his life. And, you know, that's nice to see. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm rooting for everybody. You know, it's hard to retire. Once you retire, you know, you have to kind of reinvent yourself. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm cheering everybody on. And, you know, it's, it's good to see him uh, find some, some things that he's, It's, it's uh, adding a, a positive impact on, on the cycling world and, and in society. Yeah. Two more difficult questions and then we move on. <laughs> okay, okay. In, in the, uh, ask whatever you want. Yeah, and I, I want to make most of the opportunity of having someone who was in the first row. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If we are talking about this whole thing about Lance Armstrong, there were a few people who were chasing him throughout his career and desperately wanted to bring him down. Do you think, and again, do you think these people were mainly interested in the truth or was it also that there's a little bit, they sensed the moment for their glory? Uh, I think they were looking at just for the truth, for the truth. I think they knew the truth. And I think we knew that they knew the truth. And, uh, yeah. And then what, you know, the, the harder they fought to like find out the truth, the harder, I guess we all, we all pushed back. And so, um, yeah, it was, a, it was like a, it was a battle and, uh, and they didn't, you know, they didn't back down and, you know, we didn't back down, yeah. but, uh, and it just got heightened, but yeah, I think they were, I think they knew the truth and they just wanted to hear it. Yeah. yeah. And, and good for, and good for them. Absolutely. You know, I, During my career, that was hard for me to, you know, deal with some of those like journalists, the media. But you know, hats off to them for um, for for not giving up. Last question: What yeah. about Johan Brunil? He was your manager for some time. Some people say yeah. he was an excellent tactician and understood the sport like no one else. Others say he was the most ruthless when it came down to all the allegations that have been made. Yeah, uh, he was a great, he was a, my director for, let's see, I think 98, 99. Yeah, I can't remember if he started in 98 or 99. I think maybe 99. 99, 2000, 2001, 2000. Yeah, for three years. Um, yeah, great tactician, very smart. You know, he was a great pro himself. And then, um, You know, he retired from the sport, and I, I think it was a year or two later, he was a director. So, uh, you know, he still knew a lot of the riders in the peloton. He still was very fresh on the tactics and all that. Sometimes you get really some older directors that are a little bit kind of off the back. But he was, uh, yeah, he was great and a good motivator. You know, obviously our, our big star rider was Lance, and so he, you know, played some favoritism that way, I would say. But, you know, that's... That's what you have to expect. Yeah. Um, has he paid a bigger price than a lot of other directors? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know. Yeah. You know, not all, the whole truth hasn't come out, obviously. And, you know, Johan paid a big, heavy price, right? Yeah. 
So some can say he deserves it, uh, you know. I don't, you know. Yeah, we all got caught, but you know, there's but there's a lot of the truth that's you know very you know deep, deep, deep underground. So he's paid a big price for it, you know. I I hope the best for him, you know. I I know he's moving on in his life and doing some some good things, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. He was a good director, great director, you know. He's probably one of the best ones out there, for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, but he played he played the game like we all did. He, you know, we you know, there was a there was a, a big secret underneath and yeah. I I assume he was a part of that as a writer, I assume, but uh, you know, he was a part of that as a director, you know. Yeah. Do you have a morning routine? Um, I do coffee. Yeah, it's eight o'clock in the morning here. Uh, so coffee. Um, yeah. I try to do a little bit of uh, kind of like meditation, just some, some quiet time, maybe ten minutes. I would like to do more, but the day gets going too fast. It's too busy. Um, yeah, practice like some gratitude. You know, work. Think about you know three or four things that uh, you really appreciate in your life. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, yeah. I do some yoga usually, um, but yeah, nothing, uh, nothing too exciting really. Pretty, yeah, I'm kind of, a, 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 uh, I'm a pretty quiet guy in general. Um, but yeah, I play with my dog out in the backyard, maybe take her for a walk. Yeah. Um, yeah, my girlfriend's got two kids, so we have half the time. So you know, a lot of times it's getting, getting them, uh, getting them up, getting their clothes on, and getting them out the door to school. So, yeah. How do you prepare yourself for important moments? Um, yeah, a lot of, in, for important moments, you know, visualization, kind of pre preparing uh, in your mind on, on what it's going to look like, um, how you're going to, I guess, behave, how you're going to... Um, You know whether you're going to be confident or not you know try so uh that's important yeah studying if it's a you know court meeting you know knowing what you have to know ahead of time um yeah being disciplined yeah work yeah working hard beforehand you know so showing up to that important moment you know as cool as a cucumber because you you've been um, preparing you know so yeah i mean I think I was listening to a podcast the other day. It's like, you know, you see these sprinters at the, you know, the hundred meter final in the Olympics. And, you know, the typically the best ones are as like, as they looked as relaxed as anybody out there. And, uh, you know, right before the most could be their most important 10 seconds of their life. Yeah. And it's only 10 seconds, huh? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you probably see it all the time, right? Some of the best athletes are just, you know, They're ready. They're ready. They've been working super hard, and like all the homework's done. Now it's time to take the test. And but you've you've studied so hard, you're you're ready to ace this test. Mm. Yeah. How do you overcome setbacks? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. Pick yourself up. Pick yourself up, and uh, just one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. You know. I feel like, yeah, I mean, setbacks happen all, all the time, you know. I, I feel like there are more setbacks in life's life than, um, than big, you know, huge celebrations, really. Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. But yeah, uh, pick yourself up one foot in front of the other um, to, and take care of yourself emotionally. Don't beat yourself up over it. You know, you've made a, maybe you've made a mistake, you failed, you know. But yeah, you learn, learn from it, take a step back, realize what happened, what went wrong, you know, how you can do it better the next time. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what's so great about life and getting older is just the, the wisdom you have or you, you, yeah, everything you've learned and like, you know, oh, you, you can be like, oh, I've been in this situation before, you know, most of the time I go right, but this, I know now go left, you know, yeah, or, or maybe it's cer avoiding certain people or maybe it's you know, gravitating towards certain people. Yeah. Who's your role model and why? Who's my role model? 
Um, let's see. I'd say this guy, Jimmy Huga. Um, he passed away. He uh, passed away in 2010. Jimmy Huga was a downhill ski racer. Um, he was at the top of his game in, 19, in like the 60s. He, uh, won, he was one of the first Americans. He and uh, one other were the first Americans to win Alpine medals at the Olympics in 64. Uh, Jimmy was diagnosed in 19, like six years later with multiple sclerosis. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we got to be friends um, for the last like six, seven years of his life. He was just an incredible person. By, then, by that point, MS had multiple sclerosis had really taken, taken a toll on him. And, you know, he was in a wheelchair and was at a, like a full care facility and, um, yeah, we became really close in the last years of his life. And he uh, just taught me to always, you know, have a positive outlook on life. And, you know, I was going through hard times and I was looking at Jimmy and, just, and, and, and his outlook on life. And I was like, wow, you know, just with a right mindset, I can um, lead a much better life. And I think I pretty much think about him every day. And yeah, he passed away in 2010 due to MS complications. And uh, he was a great role, role model for me. And, uh, you know, his thing, his, his motto was like, do what you do, what you can do. You know, he started losing function in his body, but you know, it didn't, it didn't slow him down. You know, he was water skiing right up to the, right up to the end. Yeah. Which was awesome. So yeah. Yeah. Jimmy Hugo. My, my grandma, the mother of my mother, he, she also had MS and, uh, um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's tough to see what it does to the body over the years from it, it where i tough. got to know her from to where she ended yep yeah massive yeah massive yeah massive. yeah yep. yep. so i do a lot of work with the fight against ms and you know it's um something that yeah holds a, holds a special place in my heart and i i hope uh during my lifetime we'll see a cure yeah yeah what is the best advice you received and who gave it to you um It would probably be like a high school coach who, um, his name was, is Phil Peck. He's, and uh, he told me just to listen to my body. You know, I kept saying that, listen to your body, listen to your body. Um, this is back in like the late eighties when uh, the, the heart rate monitor came out and, and a lot of people would say, oh, you know, how are you doing? And the, and the athletes would look at their watch to see their heart rate. They're like, oh, I'm doing okay. But like, you know, and this guy, Phil Peck was like, step away from all that, learn to listen to your body, see how it's being. And, um, you know, you don't need all these gadgets to decide how you're doing. Um, know your body, know it well, you know, don't, you don't have to look at some number to decide how you're doing. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I'd say that was the best advice and I, Yeah, I go back to that a lot, you know. Yeah. I heard you talked on the podcast that you made a lot of financial mistakes. My oh, question, yeah. what were these mistakes? That's number one. And then the second one is what advice in terms of financial management would you give to athletes? Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, you know, yeah, I, I work really for a financial advisor now in uh, the Blacksmith Group, and it's been um, – Yeah, I've learned a lot. I've been working for them for just over a year. Man, I've learned a lot. Yeah, I made a ton of mistakes during my professional career. Maybe listening to the wrong people. Um, you know, when you made money, just, oh, you know, oh, you can afford a, a, a bigger mortgage. You can buy a bigger house now because you can afford, afford a bigger mortgage. And, you know, you, you don't know how long your, your career is going to last. You know, you think it's going to be all just, you know, golden, and you know, things are going to go great, but you don't know what's right around the corner. You could get injured. You know, I had a positive doping test, life came crashing down. Uh, anything can happen, you know, just bad luck. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Rushing into maybe relationships sometimes that, yeah, that was, that didn't help, I'd say. But yeah, I've learned a lot, learned a lot, made some mistakes and uh, kind of, Yeah, started over a few years ago, kind of financially started totally over. And uh, in, in a way, it was kind of nice. Just um, got my feet were on the ground, very humbled and just, uh, you know, working hard and climbing back up the ladder, I guess. But 
you know, you don't need so much. You don't need so much in your life. And just because you're making a lot of money doesn't mean you need to like um, spend that money. You know, um, and start saving when you're young and start investing it in with the right people. And, uh, and, and, and just, you know, every month, if you can, adding to that and putting it away, you know, because you don't know what's right around the corner, you know. Um, but yeah, a lot of athletes make that mistake. You know, I'm certainly one of them. But yeah, you hear a lot about, you know, athletes here in the States, you know, for example, in uh, the National Football League, a, a typical um, career is something like two or two and a half years. So yeah. some of these athletes come right out of college, they're making huge money. And then, you know, it's a knee injury takes them out and they're gone. They're out of the sport and they're, you know, they've been spending money pretty uh, rec recklessly, not saving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd done maybe a better job at saving and listening to the right people. Yeah. But yeah, live and learn. So I try to tell all the young kids, especially the young athletes, you know, save your money, save your money. And if you say... Saving is one thing, but then if you talk about management, what asset yeah. classes would you look at for athletes? I mean, a lot of the athletes I work with, they are in Olympic sports. There's a fairly decent salary, so there's not a lot left at the end of the month. But what would you advise? Where should you invest in? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I would say getting the right manager to manage your money, somebody that you trust. You know, um, I don't know, like recently, like gold and silver have been really good investments. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it, I, the biggest thing is finding somebody you trust, kind of like a coach, like a coach, but this is like a, a coach for your money. Uh, some, you know, the group I work with are, are real specialists, real specialists. And, uh, you know, if you were going to go get heart surgery, you wouldn't just go ask some random doctor down the street to do it for you, right? You'd find a real specialist, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, find the right specialist for you and, um, and uh Yeah, start investing your money smartly. Yeah, but a lot of people that try to do it themselves, you know, struggle a bit and can lose uh, lose money. Yeah, I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Back in the days, how did a typical training day look like? Oh yeah, um, yeah. You know, my training changed over the years. You know, in the early years, it was just going out and doing big, long, you know, huge miles really hours on the bike and then uh as my career developed and i uh you know became more of a like a team leader i, I started doing a lot more like interval work uh very hard intense work followed by you know by rest um but i don't know a typical day was you know a four to six hour ride you know with a, a laundry list of interval intervals that i had to do um and, and I might have been uh, some motor pacing at the end of that, you know, four to six hour ride, a lot of motor pacing to keep your leg speed. high. Uh, um, but yeah, a lot of hard work, hard, hard work, you know, 40, 20s were like, you know, I'm a coach now. And, you know, this, we have our athletes do a lot of 40, 20s, which are, it's like a 10 minute set, you go 40 seconds, really hard at 98, 99%. 20 seconds really easy, 40 seconds hard, 20 seconds easy for 10 minutes. That's one set. So you might do three or four sets. Those are really hard. And you usually do those going uphill, staying seated. Yeah. Um, tough, tough, you know, race like situation. I mean, race kind of race. Sometimes I felt like uh, when I was towards the end of my, or during the, like the uh, peak of my career, I get show up at the races sometimes and it would almost feel like, Some of it was easier than the training, if that makes sense, which I trained really hard, and, but also really smart and, re and rested really hard too. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was all, you know, all about when you're at your best, it was just all about the bike. You know, it's, it's not a very balanced life, you know, but it's uh, cycling is so hard. You had to focus 110% on it and, and just dedicate yourself. And, you know, they up the ones that, chose not to or you know maybe chose to have a little bit more balance typically um typically you know paid the price which is unfortunate you know yeah. in the hardest training weeks how many hours do you spend on the bike um 
Yeah, I remember doing 40 hour weeks, you know, I, I think they train a lot less now. And I don't think that was even that very smart. But um, yeah, it was like 30 to 40 hour weeks. Yeah. Um, but I think now they've streamlined it a lot more and maybe less, uh, less hours on the bike, but maybe more intensity, more, uh, more structure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, I remember doing 42, 43, 44 hour weeks. Yeah. yeah. Not all the time. But yeah, that would happen sometimes which is a lot. That's like a normal work week for a yeah. <laughs> person. Yeah. <laughs> Something that interests me because there are a lot of mixed messages when it comes to road cycling and the view of strength training. What's your view on strength training, body weight control and endurance performance? Uh, like strength. I mean, there's a couple of different ways we have our athletes do strength training. You know, some is uh, off the bike in the weight room. Uh, we typically have, Our clients do uh, do that kind of more in the off season. Uh, some will kind of continue that during the season a little bit to just to get their uh, really thin and they have a hard time keeping on muscle. Uh, but most of our athletes during the season, yeah, we have them do a lot of like big gear work. Uh, we're pushing a really low gear, like up a climb, uh, maybe 50 to 60 RPMs. Um, you know, I find that that's really effective. That's I did that during my career. And, um, I'll continue to tell people to do that. Um, that's been really, really effective. Uh, you know, you do big gear work, you know, 50, 60 RPMs followed by like little gear work. So strength, this is, this builds strength, this builds efficiency. Mm -hmm. And I think they say strength plus efficiency equals power. So that's kind of what we preach, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, overdoing it in a big gear, then overdoing it in a little gear, right? So you're getting, uh, you're really learning how to, uh, you're really getting stronger and then learning how to pedal a real, really fluid circle, right? Because a lot of people, if they're just pushing down and pulling up, you know, they're uh, wasting a lot of that, the 360 60 degree pe pedal stroke. So uh, ideally you're pushing the pedals equally in all 360 deg degrees. It's almost impossible, but you want to be as, as perfect as possible. And if you listen to people, road cyclists, they are scared of if they do a specific strength training in the gym that they build muscle mass. Oh, yeah, My yeah, question yeah. is, if you spend multiple thousand calories a day due to your cycling, have you ever seen someone who built muscle mass and doing these volumes on the bike? Um. I mean, it's, if somebody's super muscular, maybe they don't. They, they, maybe they need to spend a little bit like less time in the weight room, or maybe they need to do a little less of the, the big gear work. But uh, no, typically, yeah, they're they're out there burning a lot of calories. Uh, yeah, most people aren't getting bigger bigger thighs because of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How about you? Do you have people do that? Yeah, well, we are with sprinters, right? So uh, yeah. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's all we do. No, it's not all we do, yeah. but it's a big part of our sport, uh, the strength and conditioning. But I'm, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm happy with what you said before. It's like the term strength training is... Yeah, I'm happy with what you said before because the term strength training, I mean, there are so many different forms and methods of strength training with different For adaptations sure. to it. So every time sure. I think we talk about strength training, we need to be a bit more precise and for us the hypertrophy type of strength training where you're building muscle mass doesn't play a very big role we are more focused on strength and power development sure so sure. what you said about efficiency that's our goal good, talking good. talking about training you are giving back what you learned and experienced through your coaching business who yeah. is it for and what do people get Uh, yeah, we, um, it's for, yeah, anybody who wants to, you know, wants some coaching. Yeah, we do uh, customized, you know, training programs for uh, all different cyclists, all different ages and abilities. You know, this afternoon, I'm going to ride with a, go for a mountain bike ride with a 10-year-old kid who's, uh, you know, huge talent. It's uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun working with, uh, with kids. But yeah, we work with, yeah, anywhere, he's probably our youngest client, 10 and up to like probably 75 years old is our oldest oldest client but yeah most uh you know have a norm have normal lives and 
families and busy day jobs, and, but they love cycling and they have a limited amount of time to cycle every week. And so we try to make, you know, optimize their training so they can be, you know, um, you know, for their goals. Some, some riders might race a little bit, some race, race some riders race a lot. Other riders just want to beat up on their buddies on sun, their Sunday morning group ride. You know, other people don't race it, do any kind of just, they just want to get a little bit fitter and a little bit more, you know, I'd say, I'd call it like efficient and, uh, yeah, it's fun helping people, you know, yeah. and it's not, it's not about make, you know, it's not about winning races or anything. It's just about making them, you know, happy where they're, they're at, you know, and, uh, improving their uh, time on the bike, improving their like quality of life, you know, but some of my favorite, my, some of the best feedback I get is from uh, the, the, our client's spouse, you know, saying like, Oh, you know, they're so happy now. They've been, you know, they spend, you know, X amount of time on their bike and they're, they're coming back and they're, you know, they have a plan when they're on the bike. They're way more happy now. And that's, you know, that's music to my ears, you know? So, you know, just uh, people getting more out of themselves and then feeling more confident in themselves. You know, that's huge. That's huge. And if that, if that can play a, a greater role in their life and a more has a positive impact on their whole family, like that's awesome. That's and awesome. the support, you know, get, yep. and then sometimes like their their family members. Sometimes they they weren't cyclists, and they get into cycling. And, you know, the more people on bikes, the better. I think. You know? <laughs> so it's such a beautiful sport. You know, just to be able to commute on your bike around town that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And the support is online and offline. Yeah, it's online based. It's online based. You know, uh, so a lot of our clients, you know, we've never met before. Uh, most of our clients are North American based, but you know, we have a few over in Europe. Uh, yeah, it's a, a bunch of, let's say five or six in Europe and a couple down in uh, South Africa. Yeah, it's pretty fun. So we use some Zoom time, you know, FaceTime on the telephone. Uh, you know, once in a while we get to meet in person at a, like we do at like a training camp or something, but. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of it's the, the, the athlete coach relationship. So you gotta, you get to know, know each other really well. And, um, you know, that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. you, you know, right. If you, if you have to develop some sort of relationship where they can trust you and you can trust them, like, you know, and, you know, they have to know that you have your best intentions with them, with their training moving forward. And, uh, you know. Sometimes that, you know, you got to force them to rest. Sometimes you got to force them to not force them, but, you know, put pressure on them to really rest. And other times you got to, you know, give them a little bump to uh, make them push hard and work hard. Yeah. yeah. The relationships are absolutely essential. It's absolutely. crucial. It's crucial. You know, you could be the best coach in the world, but if you're, if you can't communicate with your athlete, then it, it's, it's worthless. It's worthless. Yeah. And, it can be found at what's the URL? Your coaching business? Oh, what's, uh, yeah, it's called Tyler Hamilton Training. Yeah, dot com. Okay. Cool. Yep, yep, yep. Tyler, you have written a book with Daniel Coyle, The Secret yeah. Race. What does the reader get from the book? Oh, man, what does the reader get from the book? Um, yeah, I guess a snapshot of, you know, what professional cycling was like. Uh, at the elite level for some, for, you know, uh, you know, the underworld of professional cycling at that time. Yeah. You know, a lot of the dark secrets, you know, I'm, I'm proud of writing the book. I'm not necessarily that proud of what's in the book. You know, it was, uh, that was one of the hardest things I ever did was to write that book yeah. for sure. You know, but in a way it was almost, it was like two and a half years of therapy. Mm. And but, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm proud of writing it, and it was it was a truth that I feel like it just uh, it needed to, to be told, you know. Yeah. Not you know, not not a lot of people weren't that happy about it, obviously. But um, but that truth needed to be told. It was a dark underworld that uh, I guess needed to be exposed. Yeah, and you mentioned also that Daniel Coyle he did something like 60 plus interviews interviews with you in order to extract all the stories yeah we did a lot we spent a lot of time together in person or you know over the telephone yeah i think it was 60 to 65 interviews mm. yeah 
Yeah. We went to Europe together to find some of the places, you know, where some of the uh, mayhem went down, so to speak. And uh, yeah, yeah, we spent a lot of time together. Great guy. I feel very fortunate that I had a co-author like Dan Coyle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Talking about Dan Coyle, do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? <laughs> You should interview Dan. He'd be great. He's super smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, what else I'll is give going... you his, I'll pass along his info if you want. Oh, that would be great. That would definitely yeah. be great. Nice guy. What else is going on in the life of Ta Tyler Hamilton at this moment? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, here in Missoula, Montana. Uh, right now, I, I travel down to Denver, Colorado, for like a work week every probably three weeks or so. Uh, and so I've been working for a financial advisory group down there, um, kind of a, like a real job. And uh, that's been a lot of fun, learning a lot about the, the industry and um, you know helping people do smart things with their money. That's been a lot of fun. And I like it because it's been just something completely different than you know what I've done in the past. You know, I did study economics and co back in college, so. Um, so yeah, it's been fun to kind of, um, try something totally new and, uh, I have a, it's a great team and that's, so every day. Yeah. I, I, uh, my number one focus is, is that, uh, I also have a coaching business. Uh, I have one head coach who helps me along the way. That's, uh, his name's Jim Capra. So we're in daily contact. Uh, and I, yeah, I spent a bunch of time, uh, working, um, uh, with a nonprofit, Uh, that helps people with MS, helps them live better lives. Uh, with, with the pe people that have MS and their support partners and support families. So, yeah. And then I've, yeah, uh, I guess I'm a part-time dad with a couple kids. Yeah. Um, yeah, girlfriend's got two young kids, six and eight. They're great. And uh, I have a one-year-old golden retriever named Sailor. Yeah. I stay busy, but yeah, I don't do, I'm not, Let's say I ride my bike maybe a couple times a week, usually my mountain bike. Yep. Um, you know, life's pretty, I'd say, a lot more simple now than it used to be. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I've enjoyed living here in Montana. It's, um, you know, it's like the fourth biggest state out of the 50 states, and there's only like a million people here. So okay. there's a lot, there's a lot of big space and outdoors. And I like, I love getting out in nature. I love animals getting out in nature. So. Yeah. Where can people find you? Uh, what do you mean? Online. Oh, like, oh yeah, where man. Like, um, God, I don't even know where. I don't even know my stuff. I haven't done Instagram mm -hmm. forever, but I have an Instagram account somewhere out there. Um, I'll I figure it out. Yeah, we'll All figure right. it out. Can you, yeah, I think. Let's see. Twitter. I have Twitter and Instagram, but I'm yeah, I'm not on it so often. I should probably get back on it. Social media is a weird thing. I kind of, <laughs> it kind of ebbs and flows with me. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll, I'll find it. I'll send it to you. Really cool. Tyler. Um, but yeah, yeah. Hey, nice talking to you, Christian. Thanks yeah, a lot for your a, time. Thanks for the real honor. Words. Yeah. Awesome. Are you watching uh, the Tour de France right now? Have you been watching the tour? Occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Hey, well, good luck with your coaching. Good luck to your athletes next Thank year, you. next summer in the Olympics. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Any, um, yeah. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks a lot.